easy. We we just need to have a quick heart to heart here. Um, what the hell are you doing? This is, so the sixty five hundred XT paired with the R five fifty five hundred is easily one of the most hopefully accidental combinations of incompetence between two arms of the same company that we've ever worked on. Because the 6500 XT, as a reminder, we've talked about this before, we did benchmarks before, where we showed what could have been if AMD had actually populated the full PCIe lane capabilities, or just didn't ship this product because it's salvaged from a laptop component anyway. And now we have the R5 5500, which is also a salvaged piece of silicon, and it shows, because the R5 5500 caps out at PCIe Gen 3. This only has four PCIe Gen 4 lanes. If you put it into a PCIe Gen 3 slot, you are basically cutting your maximum possible bandwidth via the PCIe bus in half. So this is what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, part of it is AMD fumbling its lead. And then the other part is just showing you the benchmarks of how. Before that, this video is brought to you by KaleMod's PCIe 4.0 riser cables, available in 90 degree and straight connections. The PCIe Gen 4 riser cables run up to 30 centimeters long and pair well with KaleMod's vertical GPU brackets, designed to maintain a more optimal distance between the video card fans and the case side panel. KaleMod markets that these have full speed signal transmission because they use a pure copper tinning process to achieve better signal quality. Learn more at the link in the description below. This is going to be a really quick video because we're just focusing on some basic stuff today. One comparison head to head. Uh, so we'll make it fast and, and then we can hopefully all move on to better CPUs. So AMD here is doing something it hasn't done for years. Maybe it's gotten complacent being in a decent spot versus Intel for the last three or four years now. Uh, or maybe this is just its future trajectory. But what it's doing is snatching defeat from the jaws of victory, and it's pulling pretty hard to grab it. In this instance, these are parts, the 5500, that is, the R5 4500, that might have made sense over a year ago. AMD could have made them uh, at least six, eight months back, if not more. But now they don't make any sense. Intel's back in the market. It's fighting hard with the 12th gen. There's not really a limitation of supply of these Intel CPUs either. They're pretty easy to get for the most part, unlike GPUs. And so there's not a lot of incentive to buy something that's just straight up worse for more money, which is what the R5 5500 is, and we already reviewed that. But it's not a year ago, it's today. And that's when AMD's launching it today. The R5 4500 maybe could make sense at 70 or $80, but at 130, it's just honestly, it's just inept uh, as a product and it is asinine to think that it makes any sense at that price point. The R5 5500 at $160 is equally disappointing, if not a little more so, because it's getting beaten by something cheaper. But uh, the Gen 3 appearance on, <laughs> none of these are new, the Gen 3 appearance on the AMD R5 5500 and the 4500 is because they are monolithic dies that are salvages from the G-Series APUs. So these are not chiplet designs. It's not like the R5 3600 or the 5600 where it's still using at least a two chiplet design. It gets up to three as you go higher up the stack. One's IO and then you've got a chiplet for the CCXs. That's not what this is. Because it's monolithic and because the architecture hasn't shifted around that to couple in PCIe Gen 4 in that monolithic piece of silicon, you end up with basically an APU without the actual IGP part of the integrated graphics part of the combination of the two. And uh, that's gonna be low end, which is fine, as long as it's priced that way. But the thing we're doing here is expanding on our original testing because many of you made an excellent point at the top of the comments, which is how silly it is, for being generous, that AMD would both launch a PCIe Gen 4x4 video card and follow it up with the part that would pair well with it in price, they're both budget parts, except it's limited to Gen 3. So we're gonna show you why this is bad and then we'll talk a little bit more about it. But, you know, that pretty much sums it up. Let's get started. So first of all, a reminder of the PCIe Gen 4 versus Gen 3 by 4 comparison we did previously. We'll pop that recap chart up on the screen. You can see that at most we're seeing 15% differences. For the testing we're doing today, we pulled both 
CPU benchmarks and GPU benchmarks that we run, meaning CPU bound typically and GPU bound so that we can get a good mix of both types of workloads. Our first one is F1 2021. In this one, the original test had the 12100F and the R5 5500 about the same when paired with a high-end video card like the 3080. They weren't GPU bound, they just happened to be running similarly to each other. This is how you isolate for the CPU variable. With the 6500 XT, however, Intel smacks AMD back to the bulldozer era differences with a staggering 37% lead at 70 FPS average versus 51. What the hell are you doing, AMD? This is crazy. The lows also suffer on the AMD part, dropping into occasional stuttering and hitching. Intel isn't even trying to put AMD to shame here. AMD reached deep into its bag of 2012 tricks and self-owned. CSGO has testing data from our previous CPU review with the RTX 3080s, so we're able to plot four devices on the chart coming up. Previously, shown on our CPU reviews chart that we'll have on the screen now, the R5 5500 and the i3-12100F only had a 3 FPS gap between them. Now, however, it's far more embarrassing for AMD. The 6500 XT is clearly the bottleneck in this benchmark, as it's stuck at 223 FPS average on the 12100F, that previously could sustain 251 FPS average on a 3080. At that point, it is a CPU bottleneck. The 12100F and the 6500 XT lead the 5500 and the 6500 XT combo by 10% here. So the gap goes from almost nothing to a pretty substantial gain for Intel hinged only on AMD's own incompetent product synergy. In Far Cry 6, with our CPU test settings, the i3-12100F and 3080 originally led by 9% in average FPS, but also held a lead in lows. With the 6500 XT instead, the lead rocketed ahead. The i3 now leads by 17%, embarrassing AMD thoroughly with its very own GPU. The 6500 XT was already a joke that we discouraged purchasing, but this further emphasizes just how much of a joke it is. AMD used to claim its CPUs and GPUs worked better together, but in this scenario, Intel is smacking AMD around with its own GPU. It's just sad. This is the stop hitting yourself of a CPU launch. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider with our GPU review settings, so a GPU constraint, the 12100F rocketed to 75 FPS average, leading the R5 5500 by 17%. As a reminder, we saw a few 20-ish percent leads for the i3 and the CPU constraint settings, but they'll be more consistent when cards like the 65 XT are used. Testing Strange Brigade with our 1440p Ultra settings, the i3-12100F ends up leading by 7.5% over the R5-5500 combo. Lows are also ahead here. Uh, this is, however, one of the less interesting leads by Intel, but still at 8% ahead and cheaper in price, there's just no reason to buy a more expensive product that's worse. Hitman 3 is another where we have two sets of data, one with the 3080 and one with the 65 XT. The 3080 data has the i3-1200F leading by 16%, so that's already a pretty large gap here. We're clearly GPU bound here as well. The PCIe generation alone won't contribute to a 16% difference when running a 3080, which has all the lanes populated, but the rest of the CPUs obviously help build this, like the cache limitation constituting some part of this. As for the 65 XT test, the i3-1200F still leads by 14%. The AMD R5-5500 is just behind in general for this one. In Rainbow Six Siege, with our CPU test settings, the i3-1200F led the 5500 by 3%, not that exciting, but consistent. Dropping to the 6500 XT yielded a 5.5% advantage, so it did tick up, but not as much as elsewhere. The last one is Horizon Zero Dawn, tested using our GPU review settings. This one has the i3-1200F and the 6500 XT at 70 FPS average, leading the R5-5500 by 27%. That's just sad. We paid $122 for our i3-1200F. The R5 5500 is supposed to be $160. So again, AMD just isn't even close. It really does feel like that pile driver bulldozer versus Sandy Bridge era all over again. So wrapping up here then, close to 40% difference at the, the biggest gap here is insane. That shouldn't happen with basically ever in CPU comparisons, but or GPU comparisons of, of this type. But that's what happens when you combine these technologies. So the uh, Gen 4, Gen 3 limitation is real. We've shown this before, but showing it with low-end CPUs really helps illustrate the true problem of this thing uh, and shows why you just shouldn't buy the R5 5500 or the R5 4500, even if you're planning to use a video card that is more uh, capable than this one is. So if anything, we've at least gotten some good quality education and research here 
Thanks, AMD. Uh, showing how it's not just cash that's a limiter on the 5500. And that was one of the limiters we talked about in the 5500 review. But it can also be the PCIe generation. Historically, if you're not aware, just as a, an educational point here, PCIe Gen 3x16 versus PCIe Gen 4x16 with something like a 3080 or a 3090, the differences aren't that big. There are some applications where you can really stress it if you use something like the 3D Mark PCIe specific bandwidth test, then you start to see the gap more. But in real world scenarios like gaming for the most part, uh, most production applications, those differences don't amount to much more than a couple percentage points and it's single digit percentage points. We've shown this in the past with high end video cards. So the interesting part for us as an educational piece is seeing how at the low end, where you wouldn't expect much of a difference, it can start to make a big difference, uh, specifically because the lanes have been cut down as well. So when you have PCIe Gen 4x4, four four and you, it's, it's a doubling. So PCIe Gen 4 is roughly two times per lane the bandwidth capabilities, the maximum theoretical bandwidth, doesn't mean the card uses it, of PCIe Gen 3. And you go from uh, PCIe Gen 3x4 to PCIe Gen 3x8, it's about the same as PCIe Gen 4x4. Four and if this had eight lanes possible on it, then uh, you'd still be okay, but it doesn't. So anyway, that's kind of it for this one. We said it'd be short. It's a little bit, it's you know, fun in a sad way, which is just seeing AMD. Here's the problem we have with it. This is AMD killing its hard earned brand credibility, what some people like to call mind share, where people have started to respect it. They respect Ryzen. Uh, people have, have gotten out of that mentality of you can only trust Intel because of the stable platform and have gotten into, okay, actually they're both making pretty good stuff right now. And if one's not available, it's not the end of the world if I buy the other one. So AMD, if it takes this approach going forward, it is going to claw back that increase in its perception as a quality brand and start to again establish itself as the second choice or worse, which is like bulldozer era where you wouldn't even buy it as a second choice. You'd be better off buying an older Intel CPU or an older AMD CPU. The Phenom 2s were better than the original bulldozer launch. So AMD, please don't do that. That's it for this one. Go to store.gamersaccess.net to help us out directly. Thank you for leaving those comments on the last one. Always feel free to leave comments about interesting points like that because it's a fun research piece. So happy to, to follow up on it for those of you who asked about it. And you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus for extra videos. Subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.